For a while now, researchers have proven something that may seem pretty obvious, that the more women you have in government, the more women's issues tend to get addressed. On average, we really do see that when women are elected to politics in countries all over the world, we see more attention to issues that women tend to prioritize. And so often that looks like more attention to health care, more attention to poverty alleviation, and more attention to the needs and the rights of women and children. This is Amanda Clayton. She teaches political science at the University of California, Berkeley, and has done extensive research not only on what happens when women have greater representation in government, but also the best way to get women elected. And much of her research has focused on gender quotas and how they can have a dramatic effect. So in Uganda, they adopted a quota back in 1989, and it has ushered in a sea change, a huge number of women in politics, over what we often think of the critical threshold of 30%. And the women there are quite remarkable, and they'll often hold the government to account for issues that are really important to them, particularly issues around women's rights. And just to give you an example of this, several years ago, it came to the attention of women in the Ugandan parliament uh, that not enough money was being spent on maternal health. And in fact, there was a woman, a parliamentary staffer who died in childbirth. And this was really a rallying cry to women in the Ugandan parliament that more money, more government funds needed to be dedicated to maternal health. And they actually shut the government down. They refused to legislate. They refused to show up to their jobs until the president, Museveni, dedicated or promised that he would put more money into maternal health care. So this is an example of women coming together and using their power to bring attention to an issue that it would be hard to imagine would get a lot of attention if women weren't there. From Foreign Policy, this is the Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. I'm Rena Nainen. Uganda isn't the only African country that experimented with gender quotas for elections. In 2005, the tiny landlocked nation of Lesotho implemented one. Reporter Pascalina Kabi reports from the capital city of Maseru. Lesotho is popularly known in Africa as a mountain kingdom. This is because of its beautiful network of mountains. It's a small landlocked country in southern Africa with a population of 2.2 million people. And it is ruled by a constitutional monarchy. For a long time, we have been ruled by kings, by chiefs, which was uh, dominated by males. This is Mandebu Helen Mabeta. She fights for gender rights at the organization called Gender Links. Mabeta says part of the challenge of her organization is to undo gender stereotypes that have persisted in Lesotho for centuries. So even when we went into democracy, we tend to think that men can do better. But around the late 90s, there started to be real change in Lesotho when it came to gender rights, especially when Pakadita Musisidi became prime minister in 1998. Musisidi lost his father when he was still in school. It's an experience that deeply impacted his attitudes towards women. This is according to Lesaole Hoshla, who served directly underneath Musisidi as the country's deputy prime minister. He never forgets at a time when life was very difficult and he had to walk long distances to school and his mother would be out there standing outside, if there's rain, if there's snow, if there's anything that would threaten him, she would be the first one to be out and to make sure he is back home safely. Musisidi's family remained strong because of the sheer will and determination of his mother, says Lehoshla. With that frame of mind and understanding, it wasn't difficult for him to see that women are strong and they are people of determination. They are the pillar of the family. Why would you now sideline them or marginalize them in matters of state? During that time, there was political will to include women. Under the Musisidi leadership, real reform began taking shape. Musisidi's government passed a landmark gender parity law 
which set quotas for women's representation in national parliament. Here is community leader Mante Bohele Mabeta again. Having speakers, women speakers and everything, I think there were around 34% women representation in both houses in 2012. In December of 2006, the Lesotho Parliament successfully enacted the Legal Capacity of Married Persons Act, a law that uplifted the status of women in marriages. And then in 2010 came the Land Reform Act. This meant for the first time, women would buy and have land registered under their names. Mosesidi's push to have more women was influenced by many sources. First was his strong connection to his mother. There were also strong women in his cabinet that were advocating for change. Additionally, there was a financial incentive. I think sometimes they commit because if you don't, you are most likely to face some sanctions. Being such a small country, Lesotho has largely been able to access outside markets and resources through its membership in the South and African Development Community, or SADC. Beginning in 2008, the SADC adopted new gender protocols which aim to eliminate discrimination of women and ensure that member countries implement gender-responsive legislations. Lesotho under Mosisidi was at the forefront of complying, says his right-hand man, Lehoshla. Our system was first past the post. But unfortunately, these reforms were met with fierce resistance. Men saying, ah, no, 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 guys, this is now not acceptable to us. And the women folk in the party, too, were not making it any easier because they did not support their women folk and candidates. And so we are confronting a very serious problem. And so what could we do? Mabeta says a big problem was on the local level. You really don't see women like going out, taking ownership, although these laws are there. In most cases, you will find that it's still more inclined towards men. So while the laws had changed, attitudes had not. Much of this is because local chiefs had not changed their ways. The practice in chieftaincy was that the lineage is paternal and men shall rule and women shall not. Unfortunately for Mosisidi, the 2012 elections failed to produce a one-party government, resulting in political instability and security crisis. And therefore, women empowerment took a back seat as Lesotho dealt with the collapse of a coalition government. Today, only around a quarter of Lesotho's parliament is represented by women, and that's down from more than a third when Lesotho was ruled by a one-party government. Nobody is under the illusion that long-held beliefs about women's ability to lead will change overnight. But there is hope. Last year's results saw Lesotho having its first female deputy prime minister. We are now hoping that what we are seeing maybe will translate into better and try to improve the women's status. And that's what it's all about. For the hidden economics of remarkable women, I am Pascalina Gabi. Next, we'll hear more from my conversation with Berkeley professor Amanda Clayton and her findings on best practices for getting more women into office. More on that after the break. Welcome back to The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, a production of Foreign Policy. I'm Rena Nainen. Now that we have a sense of what happened in Lesotho, we want to get a broader picture of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to getting more women in office. For that, we turn back to my conversation with UC Berkeley political science professor Amanda Clayton. So Amanda, you've studied the impact of gender quotas in Lesotho and other places, and you've looked at the research and you've looked at local seats, how they've been held by women. What's been the sense of your research of the impact of having women in these roles in government overall, even after having a quota system? So Lesotho in 2005 randomized its local government 
so that one third of all local level seats had to be held by women. Men weren't allowed to run in these districts, only women could run, so therefore women you know, won in these seats. What's interesting is the seats that were unreserved, so both men and women could run. So women ran in those seats too, and also won, and then men also won. So there's sort of three types of local councillors in Lesotho, those elected through the quota, women elected to open seats, and men elected to open seats. And what I was interested in in my research is how people responded to women in politics, both those elected to the quota, and then to compare that to men and women not elected in the quota. And what I found actually is sort of an interesting set of findings. I'll start with sort of the bad news. The bad news is that I found some evidence of backlash against the women that were elected through the quota. Why was there backlash? There was backlash because I think there was a perception in Lesotho that they didn't know why the quota was put there. It is a case where there was a lot of pressure in the region, in Southern Africa generally, to increase women's representation at all levels of government. And the government of Lesotho decided one way to do this was to adopt this quota. But people on the ground in villages weren't aware of this conversation and didn't know about that backstory. So all they knew is that men couldn't run in particular districts, and that made those men angry. In fact, it was even challenged in the Supreme Court of Lesotho. The case eventually was dismissed. But I think that there was a lot of perceived illegitimacy to the quota policy. Again, this is a very specific case. We don't always see this kind of backlash. And this is also a very strict quota policy so that men can't run. Even in talking to women who are elected through the quota seats, they said, you know, people just think we were put in here. They think that it's illegitimate. And that was a very different experience from the women who were elected in their own right. What do you think the government could have done to make the perception of having these women in look very different. It, it's almost like I'm hearing from you, they felt antagonized and they felt this wasn't needed. Yeah. And you have to now abide by what they might feel as losing power. Yeah. Uh, great question. I mean, I remember even one quote, a, a woman said, you know, the government needs to come in here and they need to explain to the people why this is important, why we've adopted this quota. And as I said, the Lesotho quota, you could think of it as a very top-down quota. There's a lot of countries around the world that have much more bottom-up quotas. So there's a really active, strong women's movement that's been pushing for a quota for decades. They've been debating it in Congress, and you know everyone's sort of aware of the debate. And usually in those situations, when a quota is eventually passed, then there's a lot of buy-in. So this is really sort of a much more like externally imposed quota, which I think is generally not a good idea. Mm. I think another thing that makes the Lesotho case sort of strange is that Actually, there was already a lot of women's representation in local government before the quota happened. Again, it's just because Lesotho is is a bit of an odd case. Throughout most of the the 1990s and the early aughts, a lot of Basotho men, men living in Lesotho, were working in mines in South Africa. So that was the largest employer of Basotho men. So a lot of the times the men weren't even there. (laughs) They were Mm -hmm. sort of away and sending remittances back home. And the women were de facto running village life, running local government. And so because women's representation was already very high when the quota came in, I think there was even more of a sense of, we actually don't need this. Why is the government coming in and doing this? You say this is an odd case. How does it compare to the quotas in India? India has had the exact same gender quota that Lesotho has, where they randomized local level seats since the early 90s. And what we saw in India was actually a similar thing. Immediately following the quota, there was some backlash, so increased bias against women in politics, sort of people getting angry, not a strong change in people's beliefs about traditional gender roles, and if anything, a doubling down on more conservative beliefs. But then over time, and usually that takes five to 10 to 15 years, and in India, it's been in place for so long that we can tell what the long-term effects are. And over time, we do see what we would, I guess, hope for normatively, which is that gender roles begin to erode and people, villagers, local people begin to see women in politics as more fitting, as more appropriate, as women more capable in these roles over time. Mm. It's a very sort of random story. 
I sort of traced it. I, I believe it was an Indian consultant who was working for the German Development Agency. So he's based in Germany. The government of Lesotho somehow hired him or he got contracted to work in Maseru, in Lesotho's capital. And they asked him, how do we improve women's representation in local politics? And he had he knew this experience from India and he suggested this to them. So it's a very unique, specific situation. That's so interesting about that connection between India. Tell us a little bit more about what led to this type of gender quota law passing. In Lesotho, I think it was quite sudden and somewhat random. And I should say, actually, in Lesotho, it doesn't exist anymore. It was so unpopular that it existed between 2005 and 2011. And then they got rid of it because they didn't like that it restricted some districts where men couldn't run for them. So now it's only India that has this particular type of gender quota. What do you think, based on your studying of both places, what do you think you've learned about these quotas, these gender quotas in politics? What works and what doesn't work? So I think gender quotas that are more inclusive are better. So this depends on the type of electoral system that a country has. But if there's a way to include gender quotas on the candidate list so that it applies to candidates and not necessarily to seats, I think that helps retain some democratic legitimacy. Another way is, I think what we really learned from the Lesotho two case is that you can't just have a government come in and tell people from one day to the next, now we have a very restrictive quota policy. I think you really need to have a lot of buy-in from local groups, from local movements, often women's movements. And I think that really helps give the quota a lot of legitimacy. You know, as you mentioned and, and have been talking, you've really researched a lot on gender quotas in Lesotho. I want to go deeper into the study that you did about gender quotas and how they influence people's attitudes towards traditional leaders. I'm curious, why did you choose to analyze that and feel that was so important to focus on? In Lesotho, chiefs who are predominantly, if not exclusively, male tend to hold the most authority. And this authority is real. So it's in terms of resolving local disputes. In Lesotho, it's also about giving individuals land rights, rights to graze cattle is, is one of the biggest things that chiefs do. And that's a huge source of power and authority. And in Lesotho, the chiefs are meant to work with local councillors to do these sorts of things, including allocate land. And so I was really interested when the chief has to work with a woman in this position, what does that do to the chief's authority? Because that's a sort of unnatural pairing. You would typically think of a, a chief working with a man, particularly if it has to do with cattle raising, which is a very much a male domain in Lesotho. And what I found was that when a chief works with a woman, it kind of reduces the perceived authority of the chieftaincy. And you might think of that as a, a positive thing if you think of hereditary chiefs as being somewhat in contrast to democratic politics, right? It's sort of a, a different and parallel system. So in a way, I think I frame in the paper as it promoting more buy-in uh, in local democratic politics as opposed to the chieftaincy. Was there anything that really surprised you in your findings? I wasn't expecting the amount of backlash that I found, but when I looked at more indirect measures, so how it affected perceptions of the chieftaincy or traditional leaders, or how it affected gender biases, particularly among younger people, there we sort of see evidence that actually these really conservative gender norms are beginning to weaken and dissipate if you ask in more indirect ways. How do you think the views of women changed because of this quota? Sure. We looked at this a few different ways. We looked at explicit views towards women in politics and then more implicit views towards women in politics. So for explicit views, we just used standard survey questions that basically asked people to agree with one of two statements. Do you think women should have the same right to be elected to political office as men? Or do you think that politics should be left up to men? So that was, you could choose between one of those two options. Obviously, if you agreed that politics should be left up to men, that's more of an explicit bias against women in politics. So we saw that over time, especially for younger people, people were more likely to say that women should have an equal chance to be elected to politics as men. For implicit views, we used a tool that social psychologists tend to use called an implicit association test. 
And what this has people do is rapidly categorize images of women and men with words that are either associated with politics, so words like politics, speech, campaign, or words that are associated with home life, so cooking, childcare. Usually people are better able to associate words that are associated with politics with men, so they can do that task easier. But what we found is that in areas that had been reserved for a gender quota, young people are equally able to associate women in politics and men in politics so that those implicit biases go away. For a country looking to develop a new gender quota law, how do you suggest that they design it based on your findings and your research? If the country is a country like Sweden, for instance, and they elect candidates based on a party system where there are multiple candidates that represent a certain district, then I think it's actually very easy. You just need to make sure that the list is gender balanced. If you don't have that type of electoral system and you can only elect one candidate per electoral district, it's tougher. So for instance, the type of system that we have in the U.S., it's really difficult to think about how a gender quota would work in that context. One way to try to do it is to also try to think about ways to increase the number of women candidates. So the the United Kingdom, for instance, they have the same type of electoral system that we have in the United States. But the Labor Party there has said, we're going to guarantee that across all of our districts, where we think that labor is likely to win, we're going to have 50% women candidates in those districts. So that's another way to do it. If the party has some power to try to promote women candidates in districts that they think that they're going to win. As we wrap up, I'm curious, based on all the research you've done on this issue, if the goal is really to get more women to participate in politics, which will open up the doors economically for families and help them identify issues that might not have gotten attention, like healthcare, if the goal is to get more women into politics, what really works? I think quotas are certainly a way to do it and to do it quickly. So countries like Namibia, South Africa, they went from less than 20% women in office to 40 or parity within a couple of years. So quotas are a way to fast track women's representation. And sometimes they work really well. I am definitely a proponent of quotas in cases where you can bring women in as candidates, and especially when they're paired with strong women's movements and a lot of government attention to why these quotas are necessary in the first place. If that is not an option for whatever reason, I think then a lot can be done to encourage and promote women earlier in the process. So that might mean funding women's campaigns, recruiting women to run for local office for the first time. So a lot more sort of earlier in the pipeline. I think it's important to remember that women are half of the population and they deserve to be represented that way as well. They deserve to be half of the decision makers. So beyond what they do or what they mean to people, I think just thinking about in terms of justice, it's important that women are there. Next week on the podcast, we go to South Africa. According to the World Bank's Women, Business and the Law Project, South Africa is one of the countries that's made the most progress toward gender equality in the last several decades. But at the same time, women and girls there face a very harsh reality, one of the highest rates of gender-based violence in the world. Why? We asked some experts. When I asked the question of how do you see women, most of the young boys said we see women as snakes. Snakes? Yes. Why snakes? Well, because, you know, there are common conceptions of women as deceptive, necessary, evil. What it takes to decrease gender-based violence, that's next week on the podcast. And that does it for today's show. The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women is a production of Foreign Policy and made possible in part through funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women is hosted by me, Brina Ninen. Our show is produced by Rosie Julin, our senior producer, Laura Ross Tellum. Rob Sachs is our managing director. Claudia Tady is our marketing manager. Pascalina Kabi contributed reporting for this episode. And we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. If you fill out our listener survey in the show notes of this episode, you can put your name in for a drawing for a $100 gift card. 
This drawing will end this week, so now's the time if you still want to fill out that survey. Thanks so much for your feedback. And thank you again. We'll be back in your feed next week.